Glad everybody on video could join us again for another study in the book of Esther. Um, we're going to be looking at chapters 3 and 4. And I'm calling this, I like the title, I think it's a title of a movie somewhere, but Something Wicked This Way Comes. It seems to kind of describe what we're going to see in chapters 3 and 4. Let me tell you though a story before we get into this portion of the book of Esther. Let's go back in this story, which is a true story, to the year 1932. A certain country held an election that year. Of course, 1932 happened to be the worst year of the Great Global Depression. And this country was in serious trouble. About 25% of the people were out of work. Many people were homeless. People were frightened, and they were looking for a leader who could turn things around. Well, there was a very charismatic politician who had a great ability to connect with his constituents in this country. And in 1932, he got more votes than anybody else in this country, so he was chosen as the new leader. And I'm talking about Adolf Hitler. We all know what kind of a leader Adolf Hitler proved to be. But 40% of the people in Germany voted for him in 1932 as the man they wanted to become the next, what was called Chancellor of Germany, a democratically elected leader who proved to be obviously one of the most evil men of the 20th century. And I share that story with you simply to point out that the guy that we're going to be learning about today, his name is Haman. Haman is, in a lot of ways, every bit as evil as Adolf Hitler was. But Haman didn't initially appear to be evil, as Hitler, to many people, did not initially appear to be evil either. But, like Hitler, Haman will try to destroy all of the Jewish people within the Persian Empire. Let me review just a little bit from chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 1 and 2, the beginning of the story, we know that in chapter 1, the then queen of the Persian Empire, a woman named Vashti, Amerstis seems to be her secular name right, in the Greek sources, she managed to, because she stood up for her rights, managed to offend King Ahasuerus, who had her banished, and then re issued a ridiculous law afterwards trying to kind of assuage basically his pride, saying that all women should respect their husbands and his husbands should be rulers of their household. All right, that was chapter one. Chapter two, the king realizes he needs a new queen. So they go through a process, they hold basically a beauty contest, forcing a lot of these young women, not just in the capital city of Susa, but elsewhere, forcing them into the palace. They get to spend one night with the king to impress the king. And one of the women that gets caught up in this dragnet happens to be a young Jewish girl named Hadassah. We know her better by her Persian name, Esther. Esther has been raised by her cousin, her guardian Mordecai, because Esther's parents are dead and she's an orphan. Esther gets caught up, dragged into the palace, ends up spending her one night with the king, and she gains favor with the king, and the king chooses Esther to be his next queen. Now, that's kind of where chapter 2 ends, other than the fact that there was a plot to kill King Ahasuerus, which fortunately Mordecai found out about, alerted Esther, it was investigated, and the king's life was saved. But Mordecai did not receive any reward for his good gesture. But that issue will come up later. So let's talk, first of all, as we get into our study, with the rise of Haman. So let's go ahead and go to Esther chapter 3. Let's take a look at verses 1 to 6. After these events, King Ahasuerus honored Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agite, and promoted and established his authority over all the officials who were with him. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, 
for so the king had commanded regarding him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you violating the king's command? Now when it was, now let me try that again. Now it was when they had spoken to him daily, spoken daily to him and he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he considered it beneath his dignity to kill Mordecai alone, for they had told him, who the people of Mordecai were. So Haman thought, sought to annihilate all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who are found throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus. After these things, what we would expect, given the fact that at the end of chapter 2, Mordecai had saved the, the king's life, we would expect that it would be Mordecai who would be honored by the king. And no, it's not. Mordecai is forgotten. Instead, we're introduced to this man named Haman, who instead receives the king's honor. Mordecai will eventually receive honor for saving the king's life, but it's not going to come at this point. And that's just kind of a lesson to us that we need to remember that sometimes we do something that's very worthwhile or very good, and we don't necessarily receive very, a whole lot of recognition for it. And it's very easy to get bitter when that happens. Hopefully Mordecai did not. But we're told in Galatians 6, 9, we need to be patient and continue in well-doing so that at the right time, God's time, we will reap if we're patient. Now, I want you to notice something here. The king had to order people to bow down and honor Haman. Ordinarily, this would not need to be ordered. He would simply be recognized for the authority, for the position that he had, and would have received honor. But the fact that the king had to uh, tell people to do this gives us a little subtle clue as far as perhaps the character or the personality of Haman. Now, why does Mordecai refuse to go along with the crowd? Why does he refuse to bow down or pay homage to this man? The writer gives us a little subtle clue. Notice we're given a bit of information about Haman's background. He's called the Agite. There's a name of somebody earlier in scripture by the name of Agag who would have been Haman's ancestor. Agag shows up in 1 Samuel chapter 15 as the king of a group of people called the Amalekites. And the Amalekites, going way back to the time of Exodus, when Israel had first gotten out of the Promised Land and were basically just trying to get their footing as a brand new people going out into the desert, the Amalekites, who were basically a raiding nation, took advantage of them and attacked them, figuring the Israelites were going to be easy pickings. This story is told, I believe, in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. And Israel was able to beat the Amalekites, but later on, especially, for example, in Deuteronomy 7, 25, verses 17 to 19, we're told there that the Lord would remember what the Amalekites had done and would have a perpetual war with the Amalekites because of how the Amalekites had treated God's chosen people. Now, Fast forward to 1 Samuel chapter 15. King Saul, who happens to have be the son of a man by the name of Kish, likewise Mordecai, is a much later descendant of Saul, also a descendant of Kish. We're told Mordecai's descent back in chapter 2, verse 5. Saul was supposed to wipe out the Amalekites, 1 Samuel chapter 15. He didn't do it. He disobeyed the Lord. He and the people kept back some of the best of the goods of the Amalekites, and they captured the Amalekite king, 
Agag. Because of Saul's disobedience, the prophet Samuel told Saul, the kingdom is, you have just forfeit the kingdom. You are no longer going to be allowed to continue as king much longer. Instead, the Lord is going to find somebody after his own heart who will be the next king, not you. So, Saul's disobedience led to him losing the kingdom. His disobedience led basically to serious consequences, not just for himself, but also for Israel. Fast forward some five, six hundred years later, here we have a descendant of Saul, Mordecai, another son of Kish, who is being commanded to bow down to a descendant of Agag, a descendant of basically the Amalekites, Israel's determined enemy. There's no chance in the world Mordecai is going to bow down to this man. So, at first, Haman doesn't seem to notice. Everybody else seems to be bowing down to him. Everybody else seems to give him the honor that he craves. And then the other officials go and they tell Haman what this one man who happens to be Jewish is refusing to do. Haman could have easily just simply done away with Mordecai. But not, that's not how Haman operates. Haman decides, rather than simply go after Mordecai, he decides, I'm going to go after all of them. I'm going to finish what my ancestors, the Amalekites, failed to do. I'm going to wipe out all of the people of Mordecai. Now, all of this is kind of background, guys, and it's easy for us to think of it's just kind of an ancient history lesson. But I'm looking at my notes now. Um, there will always be what are called agites around. People who basically are strongly opposed to the Lord's people, to his purposes, and to his kingdom. As a matter of fact, the term agites would be used by Jews much later during the time of the Romans, and they even use it sometimes today, sadly in kind of racist ways, to refer to people that are opposed to modern-day people of Israel. But nevertheless, we are told in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. Haman just happens to be the latest embodiment of this hatred for God's people an ongoing spiritual conflict between basically the people of God versus the, what we are faced with in terms of this present evil world. The issue for us is simply this. When we are faced with a modern day Haman, say like an Adolf Hitler, or some other person that is demanding our allegiance rather than keeping our allegiance to God, when we are faced by a modern day Haman, will we bow down or will we resist? There's still Hamans out there in the world. There's these type of people that exist in the modern day world. We're just very fortunate in our country that we don't, at least at this point, have to deal with people like this. But they're out there. It's interesting, the German pastor by the name of Martin Niemöller, he wrote this around the time that Hitler came to power in Germany. Here's what Niemöller wrote. In Germany, they, the Nazis, came first for the communists. And I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant Christian. Then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak up. So, Naaman decides, excuse me, not Naaman, but Mordecai decides to practice what's called civil disobedience. This is not the only time somebody does this in Scripture. It was done back in the time of Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 22, where Pharaoh ordered basically the killing of the male babies of the nation of Israel and the Israelite midwives refused to do that. That was civil disobedience. 
It was done in the book of Daniel when Daniel in Daniel chapter 1 refused to eat the king's food, possibly because of contamination and the fact that it had been offered to pagan gods. Daniel chapter 3 where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had created. Daniel chapter 6 when Daniel refused to stop praying to the Lord even though there was an edict issued by the king that people had to only pray to the king. So the point is this happens over and over again also in New Testament times as well. So when we go over for example to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, where the beginnings of persecution is, are starting to happen to the early church. And in Acts chapter 5, the apostles have been locked up in the prison within the temple in Jerusalem. They are then brought out before the high priest and the leaders of the Sanhedrin. And I'm going to start reading in Acts 5, beginning at verse 27. Here we go. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council, that's the Jewish ruling council, and the high priest interrogated them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue to teach in this name, meaning Jesus. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. In other words, you're making us sound like we're guilty for killing Jesus. They are but so is every other sinner. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. That's again civil disobedience. That's what Mordecai is doing when he stands up to Haman. Haman probably thought something like this when he found out about Mordecai. How dare this Jew, this enemy of my people, refused to give me honor and respect. Now we already learned that King Ahasuerus definitely has his faults. For one thing, he's definitely a man given to excess, and whoever talks to him last seems to be the person who influences him. But Haman makes Ahasuerus look like Mr. Moderation. Committing genocide because of one man's refusal to honor him? What well, we have to realize, there's more than just Haman at work here. There is something very satanic in Haman's hatred for God's people. Read sometime Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. And when they're given there a little hint of just how much Satan hates the people of Israel, and likewise Satan hates the church. All right. Let's take a look at Haman's evil plan. Verse 7, in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, we'll talk about Nisan in just a second, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, that is the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, oh, you know what, let me pause there for just a second. First of all, the pur. What the heck is the pur? The Hebrew term is the word goral. It looks like a dice. All right? It would have little cuneiform letters sometimes cut on the different sides of the cube, or it would have simply dot, dots, so it very much looked like a modern-day die. What Haman is trying to do is to figure out what would be the best time to carry out this plan before I go and ask the king. Now, notice... He's already figured out the king's going to go along with whatever he says. He's just trying to cover all of his bases to find out what's the best time, the most propitious time to approach the king. Notice they're casting this die in the month of Nisan. And no, it has nothing to do with the cars, okay? Nisan happens to be the month, the Jewish month, when Passover is celebrated. Passover was, of course, the celebration that honors God's deliverance of his people out of Egypt. The death of the Egyptian firstborn, the Egyptians basically finally evicting Israel out of their nation as a result of that. It's God's deliverance. 
which kind of sets the idea simply in this way. A thousand years later, we're now up to about 474 BC, with the events we're reading here in chapter 3, will God deliver his people once more like he did a thousand years earlier? Well, yes, we're going to find out he will, but it's not going to be necessarily an outward miracle or miracles like what happened during the time of Passover. So anyway, the die is being cast, the die is being cast, and then finally he gets a date, okay? We're told it's the month of Adar. What that means is simply this. Adar is the month in the Jewish calendar it's just before Nisan. In our American English calendars, it falls sometimes between February and March. It fluctuates back and forth because the Jews use a 30-day lunar calendar. So it changes. But usually in February, March is when Jewish people today celebrate the Feast of Purim. All right? Purim is simply the word that comes from this little die that Haman was casting to find out when to set up and go to the king and ask the king's permission. Okay, let's go back now. Verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of the kingdom. Notice he doesn't say who they are. Their laws are different from those of other people, that is true. And they do not comply with the king's laws. That's not true. So it's not of the king's interest to let them remain. If it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they will be eliminated. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry out the king's business to put into the king's treasury. What the heck? How much is 10,000? talents of silver, it's two-thirds of the annual income of the Persian Empire. A talent is how much weight of silver an average man could carry, roughly about 75 to 100 pounds. 300 tons of silver. Now, either Haman had this kind of money readily available, which meant he was a fantastically wealthy man, or he was counting on plunder from the Jews, or he was simply bluffing. But notice he's very careful what he tells the king and what he doesn't tell the king. Especially, it's basically a truth, half-truth, and an out-and-out -out lie with a bribe thrown in to sweeten the deal for the king. Then the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the silver is yours, the people also, do with them as you please. Does the king ask any questions? He just completely trusts and believes whatever he's told. He goes along with it. Proverbs 18, 13, it's not an exact parallel, but it's something to think about. If one gives an answer before he hears it, it is his folly and shame. What follows? The decree is written up to annihilate the Jews on that particular date in the month of Adar. It is sent throughout the entire empire. And we're told at the end of chapter 3, the couriers went out, speeded by the king's order, while the decree was issued in the citadel of Susa, while the king and Haman sat down to drink. The city of Susa was agitated, or basically very, very upset. It's kind of the disconnect between Ahasuerus and Haman. They don't care. They're oblivious to what's going on, even in the capital city through the issuance of this decree. Now that takes us to chapter 4. I love what Adele Berlin, a Jewish scholar, says about chapter 4 in this book. She says God is most present and most absent in this chapter. Meaning that the Lord is definitely there because He's working behind the scenes, but as we've already noticed elsewhere in the book of Esther, His name does not appear. 
But nevertheless, the Lord is definitely working events behind the scene, beginning with the fact of Esther's elevation to a position where potentially she can intervene and stop this genocide before it takes place. So let's pick it up now, chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai heard of everything that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. And he came as far as the king's gate, for no one could enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is a symbol that basically someone is in deep grief, someone is in mourning. Nobody wants to hear about deep grief and mourning or upset the king. So Mordecai is not allowed to enter the king's palace. Instead, he's wailing and weeping outside the king's palace. And notice the Jews throughout the entire empire are doing this as well. Now, you need to realize this. Ordinarily, you didn't wail and weep unless you also prayed to the Lord at the same time. And even though it's not said here that they were praying to the Lord, believe me, they were praying to the Lord. All right? Esther finally hears about this. Because obviously she's in seclusion within the palace. Somebody finally comes and tells her, hey, you know what your, your guardian, your cousin is doing? Verse 4. Then Esther's attendants and her eunuchs came and informed her, and the queen was seized by, my Bible says, a great fear. Other Bibles translate this differently. But here's what's partly going on in Esther's mind. She's thinking, first of all, why is my adopted father so upset that he's acting this way? But also, she's thinking, Mordecai, you told me not to draw attention to myself, but to have, basically to, some, to hide my Jewish identity. You're not hiding the fact that you're a Jew by screaming, wailing, and gnashing your teeth and dressed in sackcloth out there. You're doing the exact opposite of what you had told me to do. What is going on? That's the reason why in the next paragraph we're told she sends out clothes to Mordecai so that he can put off the sackcloth, get dressed in normal clothes, and come in to the palace area, and she can find out what in the world is going on. But Mordecai refuses. Finally, Esther sends out her trusted eunuch, Hattach, to find out what's going on. So let's pick it up at verse 7. Actually, verse 6. So Hattach went out to Mordecai at the city gate in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the elimination of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict. Notice Mordecai is prepared. All right? He has all this ready to go. He was waiting for Esther basically to make the move he wanted. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict in which had been issued in Susa for their annihilation so that he might show Esther an informer and to, get this, order her. She's queen. He's a bureaucrat within the Persian administration, but she's queen. But nevertheless, we're told earlier that Esther still was honoring Mordecai and obeying her, and now he's using his parental authority. He orders her, commands her, to go to the king to implore his favor and plead with him for her people. Mordecai's command is simply this, go to the king. Go to the king. But there's a problem. Mordecai doesn't know this, but Esther does. Next paragraph, verse 9. So Hadach came back and reported Mordecai's words to Esther. Here's the problem. Esther, then Esther spoke to Hadach and ordered him to reply to Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king in the inner courtyard who is not summoned, he has only one law, that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. Now, we actually know this 
They have records of Persian kings long before Ahasuerus or Xerxes' time that they had this policy. The only exception were, remember those officials back in chapter 1 that came up with a brilliant plan? Here's how you take care of Ashti, O king. Those guys could come before the king any time as long as the king was not sleeping with a woman. But anybody else, you happen to come into the king's presence, and maybe the king's having an off day, maybe his lunch wasn't so good, and he's not in a good mood, and you come in there, and he just sits on his throne, and he holds a scepter, glares at you, okay, you're dead. The king has to take the initiative to extend his scepter. Here's the problem. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. With a changeable man like Ahasuerus, 30 days is a long time. Maybe he's got himself a new concubine that he really likes. Maybe he's kind of lost interest in Esther. Maybe she somehow offended him. She doesn't know. You see the problem? Look at Mordecai's response, though. This is basically, in a lot of ways, the key of the entire book, this next paragraph. The Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine, <coughs> excuse me, do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. Look, Esther, just because you're in the palace, you're under the same death threat as everybody else. For if you keep silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place, <coughs> and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Deliverance will arise, Esther. Remember the month of Nisan when Haman was casting the die to try to figure out, and it was during that month? Passover, during Nisan, the whole point of Passover was deliverance. God delivered his people. In the time of Egypt, God delivered his people again from famine through the efforts of Joseph. God later repeatedly delivered his people from different times during the times of the books of Kings and Chronicles. God will do it again. The question is, as Mordecai is telling his young ward, are you going to be part of God's plan or are you not? To do nothing would be a disaster for you. So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Guys, we at times in our Christian walks with the Lord will have an opportunity that God will bring our way where we might have to take a stand, we might have to do something, and it's going to require more than a little bit of courage to do that. It's a divine opportunity. Esther has a divine opportunity. Granted, it may cost her her life, but she has the choice. Likewise, we have a choice when those times come. Will we respond? Will we do what God wants, even though it looks really scary? Or will we bow out? Now, thankfully, Esther is far more than just a pretty face. This is a woman with real character. And as Mordecai points out, maybe everything that's happened to you. Remember, so far, Esther's been the victim. She was part of the exiles, taken away from their land. She's a descendant of those Jewish exiles. She was dragged into the harem. She didn't have a choice about that. She was picked as the king's next queen. She didn't have a choice about that. But maybe Mordecai is telling her, all of those things happened to you to prepare you for this moment. 
It's the same thing that Joseph says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, when he tells his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God worked out everything basically for me to save our people and also for me to save Egypt. It didn't matter what you intended. All that matters is what God intended. Does the Lord have a plan like that for each of us? I think He does. Is He not always preparing His obedient servants for whatever ministry or calling they will be used for? Yeah, He is. Right down to, according to Psalm 139, verse 16, that He has prepared every single day that we will live, even before we came along. I love Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where Paul writes that we are His, God's workmanship, created by Him for the good works that we will do. I'm paraphrasing that and butchering it, but basically the idea is the Greek word poema. Paul uses there. It's where we get our English word poem. We are God's poems. God created each and every one of us with a purpose to serve Him in a unique way just as He put Esther in this unique position. So what does she do? The ball's in her court. Verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are found in Susa, and fast for me. Again, remember, fasting normally is accompanied by prayer. And this is not an ordinary fast. This is a very severe fast. Do not eat or drink for three days. Remember, it's hot in Susa. Do not eat or drink for three days, day and night. I and my attendants will also fast in the same way. Then I will go to the king, which is not in accordance with the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther, get this, commanded him. Esther now is no longer passive. From this point on, Esther is actively, basically taking over the reins of the rest of this story as far as what's going to be taking place. She's a strong woman, and we're going to start to see that from this point on. So her resolve is, I'll go whether I live or die. It doesn't matter. We're going to fast. It's not said we're going to pray, but we're going to pray. Now Esther emerges as a woman of courage. She has become a true queen. She's no longer just simply a pretty face. From this point on, Esther, not Mordecai, will be the central character of the story. Esther may be physically separated from her people by her position and rigid, rigid court protocol, but in her heart, she is still Hadassah, her Jewish name, a determined woman trying to save her people. Now, I hope you can join us next week when we take a look at chapters 5 and 6 because a whole lot happens in those chapters once Esther now begins to step forward. Let's wrap up our study with some three questions, all right? First question, when is the right time for us to follow Mordecai's example and refuse to bow down to evil regardless of what it may cost us? Another way to paraphrase this is I've told people when I was still a teacher and I've told pastors as well, pick very carefully the hill that you choose to die upon. For Mordecai, it's the fact that Haman represented a past, represented a people that had been enemies of the people of God for centuries, and he's not going to honor a man like that. Number two, when we are blindsided by a crisis, and that's what's happening in chapter four, like Esther was in the palace, what will we choose to do? Let me tell you something up front. 
if we don't have an idea of what we're going to do, when the crisis comes, chances are it's already too late. Because we're not going to have the spiritual roots, the kind of foundations we need, unless we've done some time preparing those roots, preparing that foundation before the crisis hits. Because once the crisis hits, it's too late. So what will we choose to do? Better yet, what will we choose to do to prepare because sooner or later those kind of crises are going to come? Number three, last question. Are you willing to trust the Lord's work in your life? Believing that He is preparing you to serve Him. And how we can learn that is when we're faced with a choice like Esther's. And we have to choose, are we going to put up or are we going to shut up? Are we indeed going to trust that God has brought us to this particular point in our life, in our ministry, in whatever's going on in our family, and we're willing to step out and trust the Lord that this is what we need to do, trusting and relying upon Him. That's where Esther is at the end of chapter 4. The Lord wants us to trust Him, guys, even when things look scary. Regardless of what may happen, He's asking us, will you trust me? Okay, that's our lesson for today, or for this evening. Please join us next week as we take a look at chapters 5 and 6. Bye-bye.